it's interesting when people critique when people critique the church they say things like we're hypocrites we're not loving we're judgmental and I, and I think a lot of it has to do with waiting we wait for governments and hospitals and schools we wait for everyone else to love our neighbor because if that's what the broader world sees, we are doing it wrong. Yahweh. The church is like a sleeping dragon. And it has power and capacity to transform the world. We're known for what we're against. But when I encounter people like Francesca, when I encounter organizations like Bethany Kids, I encounter what the church is for. We are for saving the lives of kids. We are for demonstrating radical and sacrificial love. And that's the reputation I want to have, and I want this organization to have, and I want the church global to have, that we are known for our love. Hello everyone, welcome to the Blessing Report with Winston Mayo, the regular Christian guy, where we are trumpeting Trump um, testimonies. Today we have a very special guest. We have Peter, the executive director with Bethany Kids, and he's going to give an overview of their work where they are training missionaries and also training um, people in their native countries to become surgeons and be able to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for Peter joining us today and coming and tell his testimony and stories of eight years in the mission field. Peter. Thanks, Winston. So, my name is Peter. Thanks again, Winston, for having me here today. It is a pleasure. Um, as was said, I've been living outside of North America the last eight years. Lived in the Middle East. And uh, the, last, um, the last year, I've been working with this organization called Bethany Kids. And one of our, well, our main focus this is to train surgeons from their home country. So, we have surgeons coming to us from all across Africa. We train them uh, at our main training hospital in Kenya and then they return to their home countries. And th the beautiful thing about our model is that uh, when a surgeon returns to their home country, we give them the opportunity, if they wish, to continue to work with us. We say, if you want us to continue to, um, to support you, to provide training, we want to be lifelong partners. So rather than those surgeons going back to sort of the best, most expensive hospitals and only treating the wealthiest, uh, the beauty of our model is that these surgeons, uh, they choose, intentionally choose to be in mission hospitals, in uh, government hospitals, anywhere where they get to prioritize those on the margins. And so we will support them in that, we will pay for patient needs, and then as our program grows, we provide physio care, wheelchairs, anything to make sure that children are receiving the best holistic care that they can get. Oh, that is awesome. So. Where did this um, organization originate? You were telling me before off camera that it started in the 80s, 90s. So how did that so come it about? It started like a lot of other organizations where there was a surgeon from the States. His name was Dick Bransford. And he was uh, traveling to Kenya. He was working uh, in East Africa. And over the years, as he was continuing to perform pediatric care, there was this awareness and this realization that if we we're going to continue to serve uh, as many children as possible, we need to move beyond just having a surgeon from North America to rather training local surgeons who speak the local language, who understand the local culture. So there is a shift in organization to be uh, focused more on this exponential growth where we can train surgeons who can go forth and they can uh, serve in their own community. So there, there was that shift in the last 20 years going from a traditional missionary organization to being one of training, discipleship, and motivating people. So that was the, that was the shift, really, that went from Kenya 
to all across Africa. And in some cases, a place like Sierra Leone, for example, we have one of the only pediatric surgeons in the country who has been trained. So uh, we, we feel like we're in a really strong position to actually demonstrate the gospel of Jesus through love and through caring for the least of these. In this case, children born with various challenges, with disabilities, uh, and who need early surgical intervention. So this is gonna be a multi-faceted um, question, but in short, could you share maybe a story of your experience there, um, along with how you got started in it and why you felt so strongly to become part of Bethany Kids? Because there are other like missions, but what like makes this really set apart? Glad you had questions. So I'll start with the second question. I think for me, what stood out to me and what led me to this organization was really that model of training. Um, I used to work for a communications company that did work for a lot of NGOs. So we do film, we do photography, we do communications work wherever possible. And out of that experience, I got to meet a lot of different NGOs. And one of the things that I discovered is some NGOs are really good at telling their story, but the work on the ground isn't so great. And then there are other organizations where the work on the ground is truly incredible, but the story just hasn't been told. And that was my sense with Bethany Kids. This was one of those organizations where the work itself was incredible, but no one had heard of it. And so that I felt like my skills, my giftings paired up really well to be able to, to, to lead this organization and to start to share those stories more broadly. So uh, to the first question, earlier this year uh, in February, um, I was in Kenya, and I think in my mind I had really heard of uh, the surgical training, I'd heard of the, the, um, the model, and that thrilled me. But when I got to Kenya, I think what struck me the most was we went to a school, it's called Joytown School, and it's a school for children living with uh, various disabilities, most of them from birth. And this school has been around for a long time. It was, it was a, around a, a long time even before uh, Bethany Kids came on the scene. But before we arrived, there was a school for children with disabilities, uh, about 350 students, no physiotherapist, no occupational therapist, no medical professionals to help these children really attain um, the best level of living that they could. And so Bethany Kids said, listen, we don't want to Tell you how to teach your classes we don't want to govern the school we don't want to take over but if you want we'll come alongside and we'll provide that much needed medical care for these children so we started working there and it went from zero medical staff to now we have more than 18 staff members who are doing occupational therapy physiotherapy we've got a wheelchair department doing like 3d printing of wheelchairs custom builds for students um, and just a, a whole a whole second life for these kids it used to be said that you could smell this school before you could see it because the sanitary conditions, the hygiene conditions were so poor because they lacked the, the, the resources and they lacked the medical professionals to help these kids overcome their specific challenges. Uh, and when we came in there, we got to see a total transformation. And our goal has never been to do things by ourselves. We are about partnerships, so we don't want to run the schools, we don't want to run the hospitals, we don't want to build buildings. What we want to do is train people, put people first, so that uh, kids can be cared for. And just one more story from that, because one of the, to me, one of the most exciting things about that moment where I got to see this school, I got to spend some time there. Uh, I was meeting with uh, one of the women who works with Bethany Kids. Her name's Francesca. And um, she was born in a Maasai community. So she's from Kenya. She's a Maasai woman. And she was born with, uh, with spina bifida herself. And that meant that right from an early age, her family saw that she was cursed. Her family felt that she, she didn't deserve to live, that she was a, um, a curse on the family. So they tried to kill her. And she had to flee and she had to run for her life as a small child. And then into her teenage years, still she was not being properly cared for from a medical perspective. No one had taught her about how to manage her own bowels, something s simple in, in principle, but not always in practice when you have spina bifida. And in that moment, she felt, and she said to me face to face, that she tried to commit suicide because she felt that her family was right to have tried to kill her because she didn't deserve to live. She was unhappy, she was angry. And it was at that time that she came across a church 
And that church started to reshape the way she saw herself. And she started to see that actually she was created by God and really did matter, even if she was different than her peers. And that church introduced her to Bethany Kids. And we were able to help her with her uh, bowel management. We were able to help her um, deal with the condition that she was facing. And now, fast forward to the future, she's the one teaching these kids how to care for themselves. She's the one on the front lines uh, helping these kids live totally differently. So to me, it was just incredible to see transformation of an individual, but also an entire community because of individuals like that. Yeah, yeah, oh, I was blown away, absolutely. And as I say, it's the kind of story where I'm like, people need to hear stories like this uh, because we get a lot of negative stories. We get, um, I sense that the, the church's reputation is rather negative in a lot of places. We're known for what we're against. But when I encounter people like Francesca, when I encounter organizations like Bethany Kids, I encounter what the church is for. We are for saving the lives of kids. We are for demonstrating radical and sacrificial love. And that's the reputation I want to have, and I want this organization to have, and I want the church global to have, that we are known for our love. Excellent. Hey, you even um, hinted at my next question when it comes to um, getting involved and actually becoming the hands and feet. Um, could you speak to, I guess, not in a negative sense, but um, apathy? Because I think a lot of people, um, especially in the Western, especially in the States, we're so removed from poverty or sickness. Um, we have medical care everywhere that uh, we may become like callous to the needs. And so how can um, a person, in short, get involved with Bethany kids, but also, um, feel as if they're called because you might have um, fear. Um, some people don't want to do mission work because um, they're afraid they might die. Or they just might not have that type of agape love yet where they count others more highly than themselves. Because, you know, we have our own lives that we want to yes. do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, you really nailed it. You nailed it on the head, the kind of, I think the challenges we're facing in the West. We're living in an era of real apathy and people feel like, oh, I click like on the thing, so I've, you know, I've done my part. Um, I think sometimes we wait for, we like to wait for other people to do it. Unfortunately, we wait for politicians to deal with racial injustice. We say, oh, you know, the politicians will handle it. My political party, my favorite party, they're going to solve it. Um, we wait for governments and hospitals and schools. We wait for everyone else to love our neighbor. And then sometimes it feels, I don't know about you, and maybe every country is different, but it feels like the church is sometimes playing catch up with this love thing. And I'm like, I would like to see that Christians start to lead the way in loving well. Like whatever else we are known for as people, we need to be known for love. And I think the way that that happens is that first and foremost, it we have to be doing something in our own lives. Before you even think about you know, yes, I want donations. Don't hear me get wrong. I would love for people to donate to Bethany Kids. But before you start to think about changing the world, you know, across uh, in another country, uh, I guess what you need to think about is what is your reputation with your neighbor? What, how, what are you doing with your time, your money, your energy, your friendship circles? What are you doing in your own neighborhood to model unconditional love? What are you doing? Because if you quietly stuff an envelope, that is great. And yes, that's good for Bethany kids. But, but for the church, what are you doing with your time and energy? Be known for your love. And I think one way to do that is, of course, to partner with organizations like Bethany Kids around the world. So we have started to see a number of people sign on as ambassadors. People are saying, well, listen, in my community, I have influence or I have a sphere of connections and I want to use those for a greater good than my own kind of narcissism, than my own cause. I want to say, I'm going to, I'm going to lend my voice to something greater than myself. So that's been one way that some people have been uh, helping us in the West and, and hopefully kind of stirring ourselves of this apathy. Uh, I've often heard it said that um, the church is like a sleeping dragon. It's like this sleeping dragon that's just been asleep and and it has power and capacity to transform the world, but we're asleep. And I, and I think a lot of it has to do with waiting. We're waiting for someone else to solve problems, 
but also that I think I think we're focused on the wrong things a lot of the time and I think we need to start to measure the words that come out of our mouth um, are we and, and I think about the words from scripture like are we known for our love because there are all sorts of things that we could occupy our time with um, I love music and I want to see great Christian musicians and poetry and art and social advocacy and and history and fiction yes all of it good there's a lot that we can be doing but but if we don't have love it doesn't matter and that's the thing it's interesting when people critique when people critique the church they say things like we're hypocrites we're not loving we're judgmental those are three things we need to wake up and pay attention to. Because if that's what the broader world sees, we are doing it wrong. If the broader world sees, saw us and said, oh, these Christians, they're reckless in their love. So, okay, right, that's a critique, but that, that I'll take it. The, if, the, if the critique is Christians, they're really not good with their money, they just give it away to people all the time. Okay, that's fair, right? Like, I, I, I understand that people will critique the church. I get it. And I'm not saying that we will always have a perfect reputation. But what worries me is that our reputation is the same as the religious elite of the time of Jesus. And when he spoke to them, it was with critique. And he reminded the people that followed him, listen, out of all the commandments, out of all the laws that you've heard, love God and love others. And then as, as his ministry continued, uh, and they said like, and he says at the end of his ministry, listen, I've just got one commandment for you now. Like just one, guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sum it up for you. Do this, love. And, and I think like as Christians, we need to hit the pause button on all sorts of other ventures and say, let's love. Bethany Kids is one way to do that. And so don't mishear me. I do think there are other kinds of ways we can do this. But as someone who's been on the inside now and seeing it, it thrills me to be able to say, this is the organization I get to work with. Because I see it as an organization that puts people first uh, and that loves well. And that's the kind of reputation I want all of us to have as Christians. Oh, I definitely agree. I just thought of like three scriptures. Uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians um, 13 that we read this morning about um, how love behaves itself. And then um, the one in Isaiah saying that he was in the courts and he saw the tr um, the the gown or the train of the guy's robe filling the room and his reply to God, like seeing God truly was send me, I'll go. Yeah. And so if that's our posture, um, that would be amazing. And then the third um, is in the New Testament where um, Jesus says that I was a hungered and you did not feed me. I thirst and you didn't give me drink. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. And he said, Lord, when do we not <laughs> do any of these things? Yeah. And he said, what you do to the least of these you have done to me. So just that posture of are we loving well in all manners? And I think I, I love the I love how you ended it with the posture. Uh, years ago, I read a book by a guy named Greg Boyd, and um, he, he talked about this passage uh, about like, Lord, when did we see you? When? And one of the things he said was that we often in mission and, and when we try to serve other people, we get it in our mindset that we are serving them as though Jesus would serve them. So we think, well, Jesus would probably wash their feet, so I'll wash their feet. And, and we have the problem with that posture is what we're doing is we're saying, fine, I'll be king of all creation and I'll do the right thing. And what Greg Boyd was saying is, is a passage like that, we need to invert our posture and say, actually, when we look at maybe in your community, maybe it's someone who's afflicted with homelessness. When we look at this uh, human being without a home, maybe they're soaked in urine, maybe they're, there's alcohol on the breath, and maybe we're thinking, oh, their choices are terrible. We, we look at that individual in the eye and say, this is Jesus before me, now what do I do? Roll out the red carpet, open up the banquet table, and serve as though they're king over all things. And rather than us coming in as the savior, we realize that Jesus is the savior, and, and we wanna serve him. We wanna pursue him and follow him and be where he is. And so we serve as though they were Jesus himself, 
rather than we serve as though we were Jesus. And I think you could surely make an argument for both, not our hands and feet. Yes, do not mishear me. What I'm saying is, if we have the posture of thinking we're the Savior, then it becomes about us, and our ego just runs away. But if we realize it's about what God is doing in other people's lives, and we look at them with true dignity and respect and love, I think that changes things. So I love that you put it there with those passages. Oh, it's weird in the spirit because you literally took the words out of my mouth. I was going to speak about agency and power because um, in the first Thessalonians, it says, don't come in word only, but come in power. Right. And so how do we move um, and give um, the people that we're serving agency, but also um, the people you want to partner? Like what are actually like practical steps with joining Bethany Kids and what does it look like um, maybe to be an ambassador or um, just like whatever cost comes to be like, hey, I want to sow my seed here. What does it look like for me? That's brilliant. I think, I think what we're trying to see is that um, we don't want passive donors who just give money. Again, that's helpful. Don't, don't mishear me. <laughs> but what I would like to see is active participants in this mission. So that's why we came up with this ambassador model to say, I don't want people to say, I give to Bethany kids. I want people to say, I am part of Bethany kids. I'm part of what they're doing. I'm sharing the, the stories from the field. I'm, I'm giving voice to the voiceless and I am using my voice to raise awareness. So there's this shift for me to say, rather than passive um, donors, I'm looking for active participants in this mission. People who want to be ambassadors, people who want to raise up these stories, people who, who not only want to give of their own money, but maybe want to help fundraise in their community, maybe want to throw a, a fundraising event in their neighborhood. Um, people who are willing to say, people have heard my story enough, I'm going to actually share someone else's story today uh, and give voice to those people. Um, and, and that's what I'm kind of hoping. So maybe some of your listeners today are thinking, hey, what do I do? Yes, please donate, you can go online, give money, by all means. But also, reach out and get, get to be part of it. Like, share stories on Instagram, yes, but go beyond that. Get to a place where you're saying, this is my call, this is my organization, these are my people, and I stand with them and try to bring awareness, funds, right? It's active rather than passive. And I think that that's the same model that healthy churches are always looking for. You know, it's not the pew sitting donor, which great, thanks. I'm, I, I'm asking people to stand up and be counted and be part of mission. That's more than just money. It includes money, right? Like give sacrificially. When, when you think of the New Testament, there's this notion of like, I, I forget who said it, but rather than the 10% model, it's like start with 10% and then give until it hurts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause like that's sacrifice. Right? 10%? Don't mishear me. 10% is not a sacrifice for most people. 10% for a lot of people is like what we spend on personal care products, what we spend on entertainment, what we spend on dinners out. What I think the church is called to is to live sacrificially. That means you start at 10 and you work your way up. And I don't just mean to us, I mean to your broader. Oh yes, yeah. you know it's funny, um, the way we do it at our church, um, our apostle says, um, pray and just ask the Lord whatever amount. And so when you just hear from the Holy Spirit, um, like, you know, we have default settings. Oh, 10% is easy. When you get a number you don't like, it's like, wow, that's a big number. <laughs> you sure you didn't misplace the decimal? Come on. That's, that's an extra zero in there. But that type of sacrifice and like obedience just to the gospel, to um, the people, to partnership, um, just being like co-laborers with Christ, I think is like the biggest thing. That's the model, you, you nailed it. We co-laborers get in the field, wherever it is. I used to live in the Middle East. I now serve missions across Africa and I, I live and I'm planting a church in North America. I wanna make sure I'm always connected locally and globally and wherever you are, wherever, uh, and I mean to all of your listeners, wherever you are, do something, right? Like it's, it's COVID and you're like, oh man, I would get on a plane 
I would be a missionary, but I can't, man. International travel is not good right now, so I'll just wait. No, don't wait. Don't don't blame it on like, oh, I can't, I can't get out there because of this or that. Like, get on with it. What what resources do you have? Put them to use. Be a co-laborer with myself, with Winston, with anyone else who is trying. And that doesn't mean any of us are doing it perfectly. But we just want to show up and try. And that's what we're asking you to do as well. So just to um, wrap everything up, um, could we do, I guess, a closing, like the website that they can get connected with, the different um, options for partnership? <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I would say, yes, you follow us online. We're on social media. Our Instagram is very active. So it's uh, at bethanykids.ig. Um, our YouTube is not very active, so if you're a YouTube producer, by all means, come and help us out. We can use all the help we can get. Um, we have a website, bethanykids.org, and I'm sure all these links will be in the bottom, but those are all places you can check out. Um, the last thing I would say is that um, on a daily basis, we have surgeons who, when something like COVID hits and we all run and shelter in place in our comfy homes, our surgeons who are from Sierra Leone, from Madagascar, from Cameroon, they don't run from the field because things got tricky. That's where they live. And so in this season, our surgeons continue to serve. Our surgeons continue to be in places that are dangerous. Our pediatric surgeon in Sierra Leone, since COVID started, two other surgeons in his ward have died of COVID, right? In his ward. And he still shows up to work because he wants to see children's lives saved. Right, we get to a place where, where things feel safe. And when I'm speaking about Sierra Leone, this is the same hospital that already lost surgeons due to Ebola not that long ago. The people in this organization are showing up, they're risking their lives for the sake of these children. And what we're asking people to do is try to do the same thing in your neighborhood. Show up, put your life on the line for something that matters because because it matters. This is what we're meant to be called to. This is what we're meant to be about. Our reputation must be about love. And that's the bottom line, love. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today. Um, again, everything is in the description box below, but also it's gonna be on the screen. Uh, make sure that you um, pray and just um, join hands with Bethany Kids and Peter. We just want to um, thank him for his time and just um, reaching out because I will give a little behind the scenes. Um, in my prayer time, the Lord says someone was coming in two weeks. And literally the day that uh, Peter sent the email was the day that the Lord sent. So I 100% give the um, Holy Spirit pass. They are very safe. <laughs> they are very God ordained. And even the structure, if like in short, if God's saying like, hey, Winston, I'm sending a man of God to you, um, just like the book of Acts, um, when the apostles would come, the Lord would get preparation. So likewise, when you pray and you hear um, the unction or the tug of the Holy Spirit to join with Peter and Bethany kids, know that the Lord will give provision for you to partner. Um, and that posture of just being like, hey, Lord, send me, I'll go, is all the faith um, that you need. You don't have to see um, any other signs besides just surrender obedience. That's it. So. But as someone who's been on the inside now and seeing it, it thrills me to be able to say, this is the organization I get to work with.